Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Women's Global Leadership Forum. Doesn't that sound great? <laughs> we, we have waited a long time for you, 18 months in the planning. Um, several people have asked how we came up with this idea in the first place. So just one minute in terms of how we got here. Four women sitting under a shade tree at Morven Farm had the following idea. What if the University of Virginia could begin its celebration of its third century by focusing on women and global leadership? Now, for those of you not familiar with UVA, you have to know that it wasn't until 1970 that they let women in here in the first place. And then a few years later, we were running it. So <laughs> that's not a surprise. Not a surprise to most of us. But we will have a chance this evening to um, salute President uh, Teresa Sullivan, who's done a remarkable job of leading uh, UVA as its first um, women president. So we're really excited about that. Sarah Kenny is here as well. So you can see women are presidents of everything now. Um, so the four women, you will meet some of them, uh, Renee Grisham, Bruce Murray, um, and Dorothy McAuliffe, who, was, um, who graciously agreed to be the chair of our um, operation. And what you need to know about these women is they don't get the word no. So no to them means maybe, and maybe means yes, and yes means we're already halfway through the project and we want to talk to Jim about getting, how do we raise the money for the next one? So that's sort of like the attitude that they approach this with. So we started with the idea of bringing together this constellation of exciting women um, with the idea maybe we would get 100. Well, after two days, 400 had already signed up and there were four of us running it, so we had to sort of put a pause on the registration. But let me give you just an idea of the kind of um, young women and a few men that are here. First of all, a remarkable United States Senator who you'll be meeting in just a minute, Jim Capito. We, we, we have three women who have run for presidents of their countries, and you'll meet all three of them, including um, Hillary Clinton tomorrow, um, which is very exciting for us. We have four college presidents, four captains of industry. We have 30 emerging leaders from 25 countries. And I particularly wanted to say uh, welcome home to the Young African Leaders Program. There are several in the audience here. These, these women and men, in some cases, have raised their own money for plane tickets to come back home for this reunion. So thank you so much for being here. We also have five uh, First Ladies of Virginia. And uh, one of them, I don't know if she's in the audience yet, uh, Linda Robb has really been instrumental in getting us to the start line today. So thank you to Linda and to all of them. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what women always work on, which is education and health and economic access and political empowerment and how we measure progress. And at the end of the day, hearing from these emerging leaders about what it takes to get from an idea to implementation. The youngest of our participants is eight years old, and the oldest is nearing 90. And we also are going to have later this morning uh, 20 high school students from Charlottesville High School. So we've got really an interesting um, game plan for you. Then the final question is, what might we accomplish? And really, this part is up to you. We've set the table and gotten everybody in the room. But what you're going to have along the way is an incredible brain trust. And thanks to Bobby Battle and the Bicentennial, we hope that we can sort of keep this brain trust going uh, through the course of the, um, the celebration. This book, uh, which is pretty remarkable, um, will give you 40 people that you might want to look for and learn from while you're here. For example, if you've got a dream and you want to find somebody to help you implement it, you're the next generation of your leadership. Um, and finally, we have these little green cards, or blue cards, or whatever cards that you've got in your packet. And it says, I will, going forward, do the following. So that's just sort of our non-tech pledge to the future. So it's not totally free coming here. You actually are going to have to sign up for what you want to do going forward. And then lastly, I just want to have a shout out to, um, to five women who really made this thing possible. 
Um, Susan McGill, Susan is someplace doing a lot of work. So Susan, Su Su Susan spent 25 years um, in the United States Capitol working for Senator John Warner and had an illustrious career after that. And she has really spent the last year helping us make this thing happen. Um, Team Morvin, Danielle Longling. When you see this cool logo, Danielle, it wasn't Madison Avenue. That's Danielle's great work. Uh, Rebecca Deeds, there's a million that run perfectly. That's on me because Rebecca's been up night and day trying to make this possible. So, Rebecca, big shout out to you. And then we had to call in all of our friends and relatives as well. So, um, uh, Kristen um, Zorquist and Susan Carr, we've called in everybody in all of our chit. So, you all have to have a great time because after this, we're not going to have any friends left. <laughs> they're, they're all having to stay up all night helping us to get this thing to happen. So, from my end to you, thank you for coming. It's really a joy to already have you here. And I want to um, introduce to you Jim Murray, who doubles as. Um, the founder of the Presidential Precinct, but also is Vice Rector of the University of Virginia. Out of the way, Jim. There you go. Oops, there's your green card. Jim, you get a green card, too. I'll fill it out. Thank you, Stuart, and welcome, everyone. Uh, as Stuart has outlined, we have two remarkable days ahead of us. Um, some of you already know, and as will be obvious to all of you before the two days are over, Stuart is the driving force behind everything you'll see and do for the next two days. Uh, none of this would have been possible without her. Uh, Stuart Gamage and her cohorts, Susan McGill, Renee Grisham, Dorothy McAuliffe, and my wife, Bruce, uh, they helped all organize all this, and I would point to them as living proof of an old adage. The adage is that a woman who wishes to be the equal of men lacks ambition. <laughs> now, on behalf of the University of Virginia and the Presidential Precinct, I'm here to welcome you to the Women's 2017 Global Leadership Forum. You see, I speak here on behalf of two institutions because what we have happening this week are two parallel events, two overlapping women's programs. Stuart has spoken of the goals for the next two days for the UVA Bicentennial Celebration event that you're attending this morning. But UVA is also a partner in the Presidential Precinct. The Precinct is a consortium of two of the nation's oldest and most prestigious public universities, the University of Virginia and the College of William and Mary. It is also joined in that consortium by three presidential sites, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, James Madison's Montpelier, and James Monroe's Highland, as well as William Short's Morvan Farm, which is part of the University of Virginia. The precinct's mission is to empower, use the power of these historic institutions, the power of this place, the epicenter of the founding of our oldest constitutional democracy in the world, we use the power of this place to bring together young people, young leaders, where they can discuss and debate the power of representative democracy, the power of ideas, and the rule of law. One of the key topics we try and incorporate in almost every precinct program is the power of women to enable and grow a country. We frequently incorporate that theme in both our physical and our digital programs, and so it's quite fitting that the precinct would be partnering with the University of Virginia and its bicentennial to produce the program that's happening this week. So this week will go on beyond the next two days for some special guests. We have here with us today 29 promising young leaders from 27 different countries. We have representatives from almost every continent. They will be staying with us, continuing through the rest of the week. They'll have a greater opportunity to discuss over this week and debate the power of empowered women and to, and to work with UVA's Curry School of Education on issues of gender equality in education. I would ask that our 29 visitors please stand so that they could be recognized.
Thank you. So when you leave here tomorrow evening and think back about what was learned, what you experienced, think also of this. The lessons of this week are going to leave here and be carried to 27 countries. Around the world, they will, we will use the power of these 29 young leaders to spread this message. And on top of that, the presidential precinct operates a digital network that has over 10,000 connections around the world. So what happens here will, go, will be spread through the internet around the world. So this is not just a two-day conference. This is a conference intended to have ripples throughout the world that we hope will provide lessons and empower women in places none of us have even thought about. So take heart that what we're about to accomplish in the next two days is important work. And I'd encourage all of you to contribute with ideas, help us in any way you can to make it a success. Now, it would not have been possible to do this without some key financial support. And the, the largest and most critical supporter of what's happening this week is Tupperware Brands. Rick Goings, the CEO of Tupperware, and his company uh, have made a major effort to sponsor this forum. And uh, it's logical. Tupperware employs over 300,000 people. Almost all of them are women. And almost all of them are getting their first job working for Tupperware. So Tupperware has done an enormous amount of good over the years empowering women. So we thank Rick and Tupperware. We'd also like to thank Robert and Molly Hardy, the Jefferson Trust. I think Wayne Cozart is here today. Wayne, thank you, and the Jefferson Trust. Also, the UVA's Bicentennial Commission. Stuart has mentioned Dr. Bobby Battle. Dr. Battle, thank you. Uh, and I'd also like to uh, me mention a, a note that was delivered, hand-delivered to us about 10 minutes ago from UVA's Z Society, one of UVA's great uh, secret societies. <laughs> uh, I will not read the entire note, but it begins with a quote, which is worth repeating. Neither the chains of dictatorship nor the fetters of oppression can keep down the forces of freedom for long. So says Angela Merkel. Their note goes on to say, women serve as the impetus for change through the contribution of their intellect, labor, creativity, and spirit. The bicentennial celebration calls us to thoroughly examine how women will continue to usher all of us into a more just, equal world, both on the grounds and beyond. This is premised on the belief that when women lead, we can and we do transform communities and nations. Our charge here today is forward-looking. The Z Society commends the many individuals who are involved in creating today's program, and we welcome those who have traveled from across oceans and borders to be with us. So thank you to the Z Society. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce an inspirational young woman leader to you, uh, a person who I am proud to say has become a friend of mine. Sarah Kenny is a fourth year student here at the University of Virginia. You should know that UVA is distinctive among American and most world universities in, in a tradition, a tradition that dates back to our founder, President Thomas Jefferson. It's a tradition of student governance, a tradition of having the institution managed by the students themselves. It's a rich tradition, an important one, and chief among the student, hundreds, hundreds of student governing organizations, the chief one is the student council. And Sarah Kenny has served on UVA Student Council since her first year here. And earlier this year, Sarah was elected by an overwhelming 82% majority as president of UVA Student Council. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Kenny. Good morning. I'm so excited to be here today. I am Sarah Kenny, and um, as Vice Director Murray said, I have the, ple the pleasure and the privilege of serving as the Student Council President of the University of Virginia. 
I'm a fourth year student and I'm studying political philosophy, policy and law, as well as government with a minor in women and gender studies. So as you can imagine, when I first heard about this conference last spring, I was quite literally giddy with excitement. Not every day do students get to contribute to a gathering that so directly aligns with their personal, their intellectual, and their professional interests. I am deeply grateful to the female leaders who have supported me along my UVA journey, and to those who I look up to beyond these grounds as well. It is my great privilege today to introduce one such role model, Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Senator Capito is the first woman elected to the United States Senate from West Virginia, winning her seat in 2014 by the largest margin of any Republican in the history of the state. Prior to her election in 2014, she served in the United States House of Representatives for 14 years and the West Virginia House of Delegates for four years. Senator Capito received her BS from Duke University in 1975 and more importantly to us, her master's in counseling from the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia in 1976. She is the 2009 recipient of the UVA Women's Center Distinguished Alumni Award, which recognizes extraordinary contributions to excellence and commitment to service. As a senator, she serves on four committees, appropriations, environment and public works, rules and administration, and commerce, science, and transportation. Senator Capito chairs on two subcommittees. During the last session of Congress, she and former Senator Kelly Ayotte of Maine introduced legislation to combat wage discrimination in the workplace. In an opinion piece published in the Concord Monitor, the two senators said, quote, in 2016, it should be common sense that women and men get equal pay for equal work." End quote. Senator Capito believes strongly that bipartisanship is critical to our ability to solve our nation's problems. This year, she joined a bipartisan group of senators in promoting important legislation to combat sexual assault on campuses by protecting students and increasing accountability and transparency. Senator Capito is a former chair of the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues as well, a decades-old bipartisan organization in the U.S. House of Representatives that works to promote legislation important to women and families. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker back to UVA, Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Wow. Uh, thank you, Sarah. What a, uh, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you all for the warm welcome. It's great to be back here in Charlottesville uh, and to see the, the growth and the uh, energy uh, here at UVA in Charlottesville. I must admit to a little election envy when I heard that Sarah was elected with 82% of the vote. I thought I was doing pretty good at 62 until I had to hear about Sarah. But uh, in any event, uh, I asked her uh, sort of off screen, I said, are, are you thinking maybe this is an aspirational dream for you to be in public service, to be in elective office? And she kind of tipped her hat and said maybe she would. So wouldn't that be a great, great tribute to everything here and to her? Jim, thank you for your leadership, and it's wonderful to meet you. I want to thank uh, Susan McGill, my friend uh, who I've known in, in Washington, who worked for uh, Senator John Warner, another friend, and I think that's how I ended up being your keynote speaker here today. So thank you for that, and if you don't like it, blame them. Uh, and uh, I, it's just wonderful to be here, particularly uh, to, uh, to the Women's Global Leadership Forum. I really i am a little intimidated. Uh, our international partners and our international emerging leaders, welcome. Uh, we are, you couldn't have picked a better spot, and you couldn't have picked a better training ground to really learn and get to know um, 
the forces at play when you're trying to develop your leadership style and what direction you would like to go. I would also like to thank President uh, Teresa Sullivan and First Lady and Chair uh, Dorothy McAuliffe for their invitation to, to join here today. And I guess it's the bicentennial of the university as well. I was relating to the, um, to the um, writer for the Cav it's Cavalier, right? Yes. Cavalier Daily, sir. The Cavalier Daily. Uh, that back in the day, I think my class was the first class that was ever admitted to, w, uh, to UVA as, uh, as women. But I think I was wrong on that. I was the year. I graduated in high school in 71, so we had such, I had a good friend who came here and was one of those first classes. And uh, to this day, she, she, she runs to be able to visit and be in Charlottesville. So uh, it's a great tradition that, that began. And obviously, how long did it take us, Stuart, to start running? Not, not long, not long. Not long. I'm an Appalachian woman, uh, born and raised in West Virginia, uh, just the neighbor to, to the West. Uh, a state like ours has great challenges, but it has great opportunities, and I'm absolutely blessed to be able to represent them and our state in the state of West Virginia. So when I look back at my time here at UVA, when I learned from the Curry School about how to be a counselor, I learned a lot of really valuable lessons and a lot valuable skills. For the students in the room, sometimes you're probably wondering, is this relevant to where I'm going to be? But it, it is. I learned to listen. I learned to support. I learned to reflect. I learned to interpret to what people were actually telling me. And the other thing I did 20 years after that, I returned to the campus to a program where I don't think is still actively uh, going on here at the university, but it was an emerging leaders program. I was in the State House in West Virginia, and they asked us to, they invited uh, emerging leaders from the, from the State House to come to the university here in Charlottesville for four days to learn about leadership and governance. And, and when I looked back, when I got elected to Congress, one of my colleagues came over to me with this class picture from my emerging leaders con uh, uh, conference here at UVA, and there we both were. And it was kind of interesting because we were both in the State House then serving in the United States Congress together. So I have great memories of, of Charlottesville here. Um, but as I said, one of the things that I learned here at UVA that I think is important, whether you're a man or a woman, but I, I think it's especially key in today's world, uh, after all the lesson plans and all the things that you learn, I learned that listening cannot be overvalued. Um, many times uh, people ask, well, who was your mentor? Who did you... Who, who really spurred you on to what you're doing? And the person that really spurred me on actually was my father. My mother, very active in, in, my, in my life as well, and spurred me on in different ways. But my father was a political leader. Uh, Linda and I were talking about that last night. Yeah, good. Our dads taught us well, I think, uh, with the great supports from our moms. And my father was a six-term member of the Congress from West Virginia, but he was also a three-term governor of the state of West Virginia. And he really knew West Virginians because he knew their hearts and their inspirations. And so when it came time for, for me to get elected to the Senate or to the House, you know, as a former member of the House of Representatives, they're allowed to be on the House floor with you as you get sworn in. So I was getting sworn in in 2001. You can imagine a very prideful day for our family and for my father. He was down on the floor of the House of Representatives with me. And that particular day, you do a roll call for everybody. Well, 434 name, 435 names takes a long time. So I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at Dad, and we're kind of moving around, because you don't have to sit in a seat. You're kind of moving around. And I said to Dad, I said, gosh, Dad, you know, he left in 1968. This was 2000. I said, Dad, you know, do you happen to remember where the ladies' room is around here? <laughs> and he said, honey, when I was here, there were only six ladies, and when they had to knock at the men's room door. <laughs> and I'm like, Dad, things have changed. But he also gave me really good advice when I started my political career, when I started in West Virginia. Because you're kind of intimidated. You're like, what am I going to do? Am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to learn the right thing? Am I going to know how to vote? What do I do? He said, the best thing you can do, Shelly, is sit down and listen. You don't have to speak. You don't have to say anything. Sit down and listen. So listen served me well in my first career as a counselor. I was able to, college counselor, to listen to students, their aspirations, their goals. 
And it's served me well as a wife and mother. I have my husband here with me, Charlie. I hope he'll back me up on that. I, I do listen to him. Although I'll tell a little story on myself. Uh, the USA Today called me uh, because I was just becoming chair of a pretty powerful subcommittee over on the, on the House side. And some of the issues that we dealt with in the subcommittee were issues that my husband works in his career for, of many years, 30, over 30 years at that point, kind of worked in that career. And, you know, when I think about this story, too, I do really think it's kind of a sexist thing on USA Today's uh, part, which they called me and they said, you know, you're getting ready to chair this powerful committee and your husband is, is working in and around this area. Doesn't that present a conflict to you? And I was a little insulted to think I couldn't make the separations of this. We do it every single day. And my quote was, well, that's fine and dandy, but who listens to their husband? <laughs> that kind of wrecks the theme of my, uh, <laughs> of my speech today. It did get the USA Today uh, correspondent off my back because she couldn't believe I actually said that. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, as we look back, uh, I think about parents today, and we have four grandchildren now, and are going to have six by the end of April next year, so we have a very growing family. I think about when you talk about listening to your families and listening to your, to your spouses and your kids, it's really changed. It's really changed. I know when we go out to dinner with our grandchildren, if they have to wait five minutes for the, uh, for the order to come or the waitress to come, what are they doing? They're, they're not only complaining, and how do you get them to stop complaining? iPad, iPhone, nobody's talking. If you try to talk, nobody's listening. So I think that presents a great challenge for the families of tomorrow. I really do. We used our dinner table as a time to talk to our family about what was going on, how things are going, and all of that. The communication and listening skills that are being developed now are different. I'm not saying they're necessarily worse, but you've got to have a way to make sure you're listening. So when I started out, all of my peers, uh, not all of my peers were supportive. I remember one of my good friends said, how can you leave your family? And I thought, how can I leave my family? And then I reflect back uh, several years later after our daughter, who's the youngest, uh, I was feeling extremely guilty, which we're all very good at, uh, streaming, extremely guilty because I was going to miss something. She was at that point about 16 years old, and she stopped me dead in my tracks, and she said, Mom, do you realize how proud I am of what you're doing? You are there. You are making the decisions. This is where my source of pride. So if you miss my volleyball game or you miss, miss something like that, you know, I'm going to get over it. I'm so proud of what you're doing. So um, I, sh I sent her immediately over to my friend's house to, uh, no, I didn't really. But <laughs> anyway, those of you in public service will find that uh, some uh, allow personal and, po and political decisions to take precedence. It's just human nature. But I do my best to listen, listen to them and to listen to everyone, to my constituents, to the ones I agree with, and to the ones I do not agree with or don't agree with me, more likely. I took the time when I first started to listen to, uh, listen to the people who work in the West Virginia legislature, who work in the Congress, who really know what's going on and how to do things and who are the best folks to talk to and how, what are the best connections and what's the quickest way to the ladies' room and all the important things that you need to know. And I learned, because no one person is above the pursuit of knowledge, everyone has a story to tell uh, that can give you a more complete picture of where you want to go in the world as it is. And it can help you make you be what you want it to be, if you just listen. Humility and an open mind, I think, are a powerful tandem. So when I was first elected as the first female senator from West Virginia, one of the most pressing issues then and now is uh, our struggle with the opioid epidemic. It's particularly bad in Appalachia. It's particularly bad, oddly, in, in New Hampshire, which is sort of a, a little different dynamic, but it's really hitting the rural areas of our, of our country, and it, it is devastating. Uh, Charlie and I have personal friends who have lost children to this devastating disease. So in many pockets of West Virginia, addiction to prescription opioids has become addiction to heroin. And apart from the obvious dangers, which has caused our state to have the highest overdose rate in the nation, something I'm not too proud of, the prevalence of, of heroin is a, has brought up prevalence of intravenous drug use and the chronic diseases that can come along with that. Across our state and nation, it could be hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, uh, which can present a whole host of other problems on top of the addiction issue. 
So for health professionals in Cabell County and across the, and across the country, really, experiencing a, a huge intravenous uh, drug use, spike in intravenous drug use, they came to me for help. And they said, we really need to have a needle exchange program. And I, my mind was totally close to this. I said, wouldn't a needle exchange program uh, prompt more drug use? And aren't we trying to curb the drug use, curb the addictive behavior? But I kind of put my pre-existing uh, opinions down to, to myself and sat and listened to what they were telling me. Local leaders presented their case about how this would save lives, save health costs, and save these diseases from spreading in our communities. They really opened my mind because I listened to what they were saying. And we have now collaborated on a program of needle exchange. We probably have eight of them now in the, in the, um, in the state and certainly across the nation. But what it does is it brings that individual into the public health sector. It has that person an opportunity to not only prevent these diseases from spreading hep C, hep, hep B, HIV, but it also brings them in contact with an addiction counselor, somebody that they can talk to. So I, that, I use that as a small example of how listening can really open your mind. We're nowhere to the end of this tunnel, um, but we are listening to one another to find the better way to serve people who are... Um, uh, addicted and who have families who have these horrible crises. So where are we? I think we're at a pivotal moment, certainly in our country. Changes in our society, I think, are, re are resulting in systemic def deficiencies in our politics. Social media and the proliferation of information, which allows us to make significant strides in education and other areas, has given us both the tools and the license to wall ourselves off from information that challenges our preconceived notions. I mean, we all know certain people are watching certain TV channels, other folks are watching the other channels, and if you watch them, which I watch both ones I have a lot more of agreement on than others, you find yourself uh, either shutting down or, or cheerleading uh, and it just reinforcing um, the direction you want to go rather than spreading your, your um, ability to understand and your ability to use those tools. So instead of listening to one another's and to those who have different experiences w that we can find value in, we're just basically reinforcing our own prejudices. I mean, we, we see this all the time, certainly see it on Capitol Hill. And this has bled through our political discourse and made it difficult for us to meet the myriad of challenges that face us. Um, certainly as young people, uh, the young people in the room who may have just voted for the first time this time or maybe a year or so ago, two years ago, uh, I think the biggest danger is what you do is you just take the clicker and turn it off because it's too much bickering, it's too much, um, it's, it's senseless uh, debate. People, you're probably sitting there going, well, you know, Senator from West Virginia, I, I don't really see you on the national news media. No, because I'm conducting my business in a quiet and um, hopefully studied way. And to get onto the media, you got to say something really fiery. You got to say something bad about the other guy. You got to say something that's really going to pop it up because that's going to drive the ratings. And I'm not blaming the media here. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. When I was on the House side, uh, Senate, or Congressman David Dreyer asked me to start a civility caucus. <laughs> that wasn't a laugh line, but that's pretty. <laughs> a civility caucus. So I did. I joined with uh, Congressman Emanuel out of Missouri, who's a uh, African-American minister, Democrat. We got together. We had civil debate on the floor. We asked our, our members of Congress to join us in this civility caucus. We got 20 people on the civility caucus. The wine caucus has 150 people. <laughs> so we should have joined the wine caucus with the civility caucus, drink some wine, and maybe we'd be more civil. I don't know. But in any event, in a democracy, our voices need to, hurt, to be heard. And as I said, is anybody really listening? With all the chatter on social media and in the news, with the yelling of the lack of, in the lack of political uh, civil discourse, it's easy to think that no one is really listening. So how do we go and where do we go from here and what is our path forward? Um, I think Stuart mentioned uh, that you're going to have a pledge card uh, that's going to say, leaving the forum, I'm going to... And it kind of pricked my, um, 
brain here a little bit on a program I've started in West Virginia called West Virginia Girls Rise Up. And it's where I go into the fifth grade with the young ladies. And, uh, and interesting, I thought that the elementary schools would kind of push back on that and say, no, we don't want you to separate them out. That's not fair. You're senator for everybody. No way. Well, most of the teachers are women, so they're like, yeah, you go. <laughs> and, so I, and so I separate them out, and we sort of divide. I talk about how I got to my leadership position, what I think is important, and then at, let them ask me questions and then show them all the different men or all the different women who have been leaders from uh, Jeanette Rankin who started in, in 1917 before women had the right to vote all the way through Nancy Pelosi being uh, the first woman speaker of the house to some of the female athletes that we see to try to spark their interest in leadership and being that next West Virginia girl to rise up but they leave with the challenge card and I kind of divided into three different sections I divided into physical fitness because that's important to me I divide it into education, because that's obviously the most important. And then the hard one uh, I call self-confidence. And I challenge them to find one thing of those, in those three areas they're going to work on, whether it's to read a book, make a friend, um, take a new, up a new hobby. I try to make it really easy, because that's the last thing you want is something really hard that they, they feel like they're failing at. And then we take a nice picture, and hopefully someday when my daughter's walking around West Virginia, Somebody's going to come up and say, I did your mom's Girls Rise Up program, and that's why I'm county commissioner. That's why I'm the mayor. That's why I'm uh, traveling to Africa to talk to other women leaders, because I'm interested in this. So our path forward, I think women have such an important role to play. Listening is a skill that we cultivate all of the time. I think it is our nature. I think especially mothers. Uh, I, I have two daughters-in-law who have children, and, uh, and my husband I, has said the same thing to me. How do you hear that? How do you hear the children rolling over in their beds when they're two rooms away? And I told him this morning, because I'm listening for it. And it could be because whoever hears it first has to get up first, and you were maybe not listening because you knew I'd get up. But at the same time, I think it's, it is it in our nature, and it's hard to believe, but true. I think our innate preference for collaboration makes women integral to the success of any institution, whether it be business, government, and we're making significant strides, I think, in putting ourselves in the position to lead. We, I already saw what, on your program CEOs of Fortune 500s, university presidents, governors, and members of Congress. In the current Congress, um, in the current Senate, there are 21 women. It's the most we've ever had at one time, but that's only 21%. In the history of this country, in the history of the country, we've had over 2,100 men senators and 50 women. I know, I'm the 45th woman. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe, but it's true. In the House altogether, um, in the House there are 84. When I joined the House in 2000, there were 56. So we are making strides, gradual strides, um, but it's, it's significant disparities remain. We need to close the gap. Sitting on the sidelines waiting for somebody else to do it, uh, or jumping in uh, is, is just not an option for us anymore. That's why I'm so pleased when I was kind of pumping Sarah there on her future. The role of the 21st woman is one of piercing the noise, prioritizing selflessness, selfishness over, prioritizing selflessness over selfishness, and achieving results. Reaching across the aisle. How many articles have you read that when the Senate gets to an impasse, the women are the ones that break the impasse, the women of the Senate? Sometimes it's only four or five of us. Sometimes it's all of us. Uh, it just depends on, on, on where we are. But we have a way of collaborating. There have been studies on this, that women in the Senate uh, and women in, in, the, in the Congress work better together. We work across the aisle better. I work with Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren, I'm, I'm not going to get political here, but we don't have a lot of similarities in our beliefs. But we believe that if you're going to get a prescription for an opioid medication, you shouldn't walk out with 56 pills if you only have a toothache. So we found common ground there. Amy Klobuchar and I just worked on uh, trying to rework the sexual harassment uh, employment parameters in the United States Senate. There, there's a lot of collaborative work that we do. We have l dinner together every month, the 21 women of the Senate. Now this makes the guys really nervous <laughs> because we're not allowed to talk about what we talk about. 
So, I mean, it's not like ironclad, but, you know, it's sort of circle of trust. And we're pretty good at that. So when we come back from one of our dinners, there's always a little bit of anxiety over uh, with the men on both sides, like, what are they cooking up now? But uh, it, does give us, uh, it does give us a chance to build relationships so that it, listen to one another about their families, talk about their states, talk about their individual uh, issues and, and, and their priorities, and then find common ground. And I think that's why you see us collaborating as well as we do. So, you know, I, I think um, my bottom line is you've got to listen not just to the people that you agree with, but with the ones that you don't agree with. Now, if you don't think that that's possible, you can go to a Kroger on a Sunday afternoon in your running clothes with your ball cap on and get stopped at the green peppers and told a few things that I don't agree with you about. I know that for sure because that happened to me about three weeks ago. And, and so she was then after she kind of raked me over the coals, she starts apologizing. And I said, you know, number one, this is a voluntary job. I signed up to want this. So, you know, don't feel sorry for me. And number two, I'll sit here all day. She goes, no, no, I really have to go. I said, no, I'll sit here all day. She goes, no, no, you need to shop. And I'm like, I hate to shop. What is it that's really bothering you? And you know what? It, she just wanted to get it off her chest. And there I was. So, um, you know, you have to challenge yourself to listen to the colleagues that you don't agree with, challenge yourself to listen to people that you don't agree with, and you'll find success. I think women can be, will be a positive sor source of the future. I'm so optimistic. Our numbers are growing. But you know what? They're growing. We're not backsliding here. They're growing. The international leaders that we have here are, are going to be leading their countries in the same way, with the same kind of collaborative uh, listening, um, respecting uh, voices from, from, from all sides to be able to achieve what you want to achieve. So as we look out from this bicentennial and from this forum, let us commit to the making the 21st century one in which women shape a better world. So I'll leave you with this thought from none other than Thomas Jefferson, of we know it's 200 years, and quote, to learn you have to listen. To improve, you have to try. So let's listen and let's improve. Thank you very much. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and we'll, there's one over there and one here, we'll pass it to you. There's one. Okay, over here. Hi, my name is Frey Halverson Taylor and I'm a student from Charlottesville High School. Um, I recognize the importance of listening but in our society today, I find that women's voices are drastically underrepresented. Without uh, you know, stooping to cheap shots that get the attention of the media, how do you think that we can amplify our voices? Well, I think a lot, a, a, the way to amplify uh, our voices is to get more people is to get in the arena. We can't just sit back and say our voices aren't loud enough and then push it to the next person to be that voice. So what does it mean? It means political engagement. It means being you know, active with the media. It means um, finding your niche of what interests you. What is it? Is it, uh, is it a local Virginia issue that you're interested in? Is it an international issue that you're interested in? Is it... Um, is it all of the above? Um, I think traditionally in terms of the political arena, uh, the, the thought is that men volunteer to run. They put themselves out there. But women have to be asked to put themselves out there, to put, them, put themselves into the arena. Let's quit asking. Let's do what we want to do and put ourselves into the arena. You can't be afraid to fail. 
many people who I'm serving with right now were not elected the first time that they ever ran. Well, you know, they pick themselves back up, put themselves back in the arena, figure out what they did wrong, and move forward. And so I think that will make our voices, uh, voices much less. Numbers will help. When you're only 20%, you're definitely numbers. Right now, uh, our leadership in our, since I'm in the Republican Party, the Republicans have control of the Senate, the committee chairs are um, Republicans. We only have two committee chairs that are women. Susan Collins is one, and, and Lisa Murkowski is a chair. So we, you know, we've got to get more in there so that you know have the seniority to be able to achieve these things. We're getting there, but it's uh, I think uh, I think it's just putting ourselves in in the right positions from the local level all the way up to make sure that our voices are heard. So I don't want to miss. I, I I would say this in terms of listening. Uh, I think listening first and then speaking, I think maybe I didn't get all the way to the point uh, of, of saying that. I'm not certainly advocating that we don't speak, but I think we speak much more forcefully when we listen first. Good morning and thank you so much. My yes. name is Catherine Constantinides. I'm from Johannesburg in South Africa. Wow. My question is, how do you define success? And linked to that, what keeps you up at night? What are the things that worry you at night that keep you up? Especially after such an illustrious career, what is your definition of success? Well, <laughs> my, de my definition, of, I, I try to define my successes in smaller steps rather than in grand things. Uh, if I can bend the curve on drug addiction and drug uh, use and, and make a difference for that next generation in my state, and then it would be for the nation as well. I, that is a success. So, so helping people individually and in large ways, I consider that success. Uh, I consider it a success. Um, I consider being six. I mean, people would look at me externally and say, "Well, you're really successful," and I feel successful. But I think it's because I don't raise the bar so high that I'm never going to get there. So I try to do incremental successes so that I that they can feed upon another. So if you're a, a budding leader from South Africa, you might rather than you know tackling the whole economy as a whole, maybe. You know, we work on STEM education and we educate more for the next jobs of the future. You know, incremental steps to me are success. Uh, the other question you asked me was, oh, what keeps me up at night? Besides my husband snoring, just, it gives me more time to think. Um, you know, I worry about the, and I alluded to this in my talk, I worry about the future discourse that we have. We've gotten so um, anesthetized to mean-spiritedness, negativeness. Um, it's okay to say things about people personally or, uh, or professionally that would have been considered way out of bounds 10 to 15 years ago. I, that worries me. That keeps me up at night because then I worry about the future. I will s tell a quick story Donald Rumsfeld, who you, you wouldn't know, but uh, many of us would know, was a Secretary of Defense under President Bush. He was also in the Congress in the 60s. And I had an intern ask sort of the same, a, a different question worded differently. Is the discourse today in the 2000s, in the partisanship, as bad as it's ever been? And he reminded us that in 1968, the city of Washington, D.C. was on fire. That it had it with the uh, assassinations of um, Martin Luther King and uh, Robert Kennedy had caused the whole city to almost burn itself down. It was very dangerous. And the other thing he reminded us, and uh, Linda, I probably shouldn't bring this up with, with you, and I didn't even think about it with you sitting there, but you'll remember this. School buses in front of the White House saying, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? And, and Rumsfeld was saying that was probably in his mind some of the toughest times we've ever had. And your father was such a strong leader during a just incredibly divisive, tough time in our country's history.
Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it.